We go to the next application, which is then an ANOVA test. So this is always in statistics. What's the next step up from a t-test if I have multiple comparisons, more than two? And so in this case, we have that where we can again do the same statistics. So we plot, first of all, the average curves and the standard deviations of those curves of three different conditions in this case. Uh, and what we can then calculate is not a t curve, but we can calculate an F curve. It's the same as your ANOVA F statistic. As a curve, you can set a threshold value and anything that is above that threshold value can actually calculate the importance of that cluster of um, uh, it, um, exceeding the threshold value. Uh, an example that we have is, for example, from um, rules data where we looked at three different groups so you can not only do within subject but also between subject comparisons so between three different groups we plot all the individual curves on the left hand side in the top then we plot the, in, the average curves and the um, standard deviation clouds around them in the top right hand side and then in the bottom left hand side we see the F curve that shows where these curves are statistically different so it's our F statistic we can set then a threshold value which you can see is reached uh, or there's a particular area, a particular moment in time where we see that that threshold value is exceeded by a cluster. Now the next step you would do typically in your ANOVA is then to do a post hoc comparison and also there this now has allowed us to do post hoc comparison. As with your um, SPSS work or your statistical packages, if you don't find statistical differences then you actually don't have a good reason to go and do post hoc comparisons. That's why you do your ANOVA analysis. Um, and so if we do find in this case a particular area that is statistically different, it gives us a justification to do post hoc work and that's the next slide where we can then for each of the comparisons calculate our traditional T statistic. Yeah? So that's how we can do that kind of uh, ANOVA analysis. What is the future? I know I'm going quite fast but I would like to have uh, time for questions. So what is the future? Well, when we do ANOVA then we compare different groups but what we can also do is we can look at a specific variable that is associated to other variables that are closely linked to it. And one example is a force vector. Well, a force vector, if you have variation in a force vector, then you can have variation in its three individual components. You can have var variation in the angle at which it is applied in the three different uh, directions, or two directions in typical uh, observation. Or you can look at the resultant vector magnitude. So what you have there is you have a vector basically and a vector what it exists of is basically a relationship between the individual components that you really should take into account. And so rather than observing individual components what you should do is compare them together and that's where vector field analysis allows you to do that. So it allows you to look at if one thing is varying, if one thing is changing, then is that maybe because something else is changing as well? Or is it possible that two things together are changing and together these things will actually determine a significant change? I'll explain this with the next slide. And the next slide is again from uh, one of the supplementary materials um, associated with the vector field analysis paper that we um, recently published with Todd. Um, is actually, if you have two force vectors that change and you can see the red one is a force vector that we identify there with the average resulting uh, at the end of the arrow and you see the variation within that cloud that's the variation of observations that we have so we have a cloud and you can see the ellipse is actually a representation of how the variation between the fx component on the horizontal axis and the fy component are associated to each other. If you were to just observe the horizontal axis then you would see a cloud that has the length of the width of that ellipse in the horizontal direction. In the vertical direction you, see, you would see a cloud that has the height of 
the height of the ellipse. But what you really see is that the ellipse is not horizontally placed, it's not placed in a horizontal direction, it's actually angled. And that indicates that there is a relationship between the two components. So when you observe differences between groups, for example, so that's the difference between the blue and the red, then you can see that you should take that covariance into account in your analysis. So you can see that the black arrow indicates the difference between these two populations. But what you probably will sometimes find, or you can sometimes find, is that if you were to look at the vertical component of that black arrow, which is the delta Fy, or the horizontal component of the black arrow, which is the delta Fx, if you look at those independently, it's quite possible that you would not find any difference, but that you will only find the difference if you look at the difference of that arrow. So that is looking at the resultant uh, vector. But this is where we are working now on this vector field analysis um, as a principle towards trying to better deal with this kind of data without making those potential biases of looking at either one component or the other component or even uh, discreetly to one single component. So in summary, biomechanics tends to work towards non-directed hypotheses. So if we see directed hypotheses, then very often those are a result of a non-directed observation that has been done preceding the actual hypothesis setting. We work very often still with discrete analysis and very often it is based on abstract representations of the data in what we uh, present in our papers. Now, biomechanical continua are often smooth and bounded, which is exactly what SPM would need to uh, use random field theory. And so that's why SPM is a n-dimensional methodology that can help us avoiding bias based on the principles that were explained. So, allows me to acknowledge um, Todd, who is in Shinshu University, uh, Mark, who is uh, basically uh, the, the right and left hand, uh, I would say, um, and who's been very instrumental in uh, bringing all these things into the applications. And I would say we also need to think about uh, uh, the quote of Sir Isaac Newton uh, about, well, if I have done the public any service, then it might be due to some patient thought rather than rushed um, um, presentation of my findings. Uh, I also have uh, the references in the slides. Uh, I can hand the slides to anyone who wants. And so I would say uh, the floor is open to questions. I'll open the floor first here in Liverpool, and then we'll see if there's any people um, in Ghent or Leuven who have any questions. Uh, any questions here? Yes, my question. Right, basic one. How to decide threshold? If you yeah. have to determine that, how to get that we need to do that yes. threshold, how to determine how to calculate that threshold? Yes, the calculation is quite a complicated calculation, which is beyond this session. Um, but that's detail that we will hopefully have documented uh, in multiple places now um, that we could um, send you to towards trying to understand the uh, calculation. But it's 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 rather complicated because it has to use that random field theory as a background. Um, but your question is very appropriate. You can't just set a standard threshold for every type of data that you have. That's not how it works. It's like with statistics um, that we use um, uh, in discrete values. You set your t-value and then you need to set your p-value based on that. But the calculation is a little bit more complicated, yes. Any more questions here? Mark? I enjoyed that, Jos. You made some very difficult Concepts quite uh, quite easy to understand, I think. Um, a little difficult, but easier than it was before. Um, you said it's very complicated. I guess my question is, how do you go about doing this? What kind of um, statistical package or, or software, or you know, is this something that can be achieved in MATLAB? Kind of what actually the, is involved in programming yeah. this statistics? Yeah. We are working very hard to make a package because there's nothing existing. 
um, except for that um, Todd has worked very hard on providing Python code, which is open source, and Python is the, the freeware of MATLAB, or the free MATLAB version, basically. Um, and so it's open source that has been published with um, some of the publications that he's made, um, for example, on one-dimensional data. Um, he has a particular package that you can access yourself and do it, but it's very, the, the step of doing that is very hard. Uh, so what we're working on is making this into an environment that is um, much more familiar with uh, to people, uh, primarily MATLAB probably, but also we'll, we'll be working towards developing a GUI, so uh, an actual interface uh, and a proper manual and everything, but that is all in the process and we're applying for grant money to um, first of all make that package, but also, as you um, correctly say, it's not an easy concept and the principles are not as easy as I tried to present it today, and actually what we've got is um, we're going to try and run workshops where we will basically take people through one or two days the principles but also doing all the analysis in that particular code that we make available uh, so to make sure that uh, they don't make mistakes because the last thing we want is that people make use of this package in the wrong way uh, without applying the principles so we'll have to do it that way I'm afraid uh, uh, so hopefully in a year's time or two years time we might have had some funding uh, to to run these workshops. Yeah?